Oi! Etienne, a very warm welcome to Real Vision. Hi, Roger. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. I think this is your, your first time. So maybe if you could just uh, give us a little bit of background, because you've been in this business for over 20 years in hedge funds, investments, even in some of the European institutions. So maybe give us a little bit of color about this, this career that you had. Well, indeed, I started uh, already 20 years ago. Um, the um, financial environment was, was totally different. Um, I spent uh, so 20 years in the fixed income market uh, as a global fixed income and currency trader or investment manager. And uh, indeed, I had the opportunity to, um, to move or to come across uh, many various institutions, some of them qu quite small, some of them uh, quite big. And as you said, um, my last two principal or, or serious experience were in Luxembourg, uh, in a hedge fund before joining the EIB, the uh, European Investment Bank, which is basically one of the biggest European banks in the uh, European universe. People basically don't know in general, but the balance sheet of the bank is uh, roughly 600 billion euros. Uh, and the role of, the, of, the, of this development bank is to provide credit to uh, the whole uh, Europe, but also the rest of the world. So it was, uh, these last two experiences were extremely uh, interesting, extremely unusual. Uh, the hedge fund, because it was very technical, um, a cross-asset hedge fund, uh, so where we were trading um, equity, derivatives, commodities, fixed income, credits, uh, globally all assets, uh, with an overlay on the, on the top of it. And then the EIB, when I was in charge of investing the long-term um, liquidity buffers of the, of the bank, so roughly 10 billion euros that needs to be invested for regulatory reasons. And before coming into this universe, and this European universe, I had no idea about uh, how regulation can distort uh, prices. And I think this is pretty much the, 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 the biggest uh, uh, thing that, I, that I've been taught and that I can, that I would remember. And so bringing on all, all of that, I mean, I guess in some ways the key thing here now is, you know, you're running money again is the state of the market because we have this uh, kind of incredible, so some people, it's an incredible world where you know, the S&P has been marching higher and although we're not at the lows in yields, it feels distorted, valuation feels distorted and yet central banks are behind it. How do you perceive the state of the market right now? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, um, I'm a little bit suspicious right now. Uh, either I've been participating to this uh, very risk-on environment for, uh, for many years, uh, except to 2018, which was a little bit different, a different context, where or when the, the, the United States and, and namely the Fed tried to escape from the uh, quantitative meeting and, 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 but did not manage to, uh, to, uh, to do it. I've been participating to the risk on environment for, for, for a long time. But right now I have the feeling indeed that the valuation have been too far, uh, are too much stretched. stretched. And uh, even if you cannot short right away the market, which would be completely foolish, I am tempted to have a lower participation to this uh, risk on environment. So I qualify the environment as being greedy, I can feel some greed in the, in the market, I can see some uh, hubris within market participants, um, I can see a quite a non-irrational exuberance, if I may say so. That is to say, a, a logical one that is, that is explained by mainly three factors, three features. First one being um, the, the American president very frequently referring to the levels of uh, the stock markets as a key fe feature or as a key measure to uh, qualify the efficiency of his policies. So this is very unusual. We had an example very recently last, uh, last week when during the conference following the signature of the phase one deal, Mr. Trump referred two times to the level of the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones as a key measure of the, the, the efficiency of his policies. And I think this is slowly and surely introducing a misperception of uh, reality that price on the equity markets can go on uh, upper and upper uh, unless, uh, until Mr. Trump uh, or while Mr. Trump is still in power. So this is the, 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 the first point. The, the second point, of course, uh, has been induced by the omnipotence of central bank 
or at least the perception that they will be here forever. I must admit that they have been extremely efficient, really good at addressing liquidity issues as well as solvency issues. The latest example being the way the Fed addressed the, the repo issue in the repo market uh, last year, beginning of last year, by injecting very precisely between 60 billion to 120 billion per day uh, of liquidity exactly where the liquidity was required. I've been extremely surprised by this efficiency and this accuracy. So I must admit central banks and particularly the Fed has been quite efficient. The ECB um, is also part of the story. Uh, the, 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 the money supply impulse, so that is a year-over-year -year difference between uh, the, the net asset purchases uh, of the previous year relative to the new year, the net impulse has increased by 3 trillion euros, 3 trillion dollars, not to mention the money supply by China. So the, 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 the central banks uh, have been extremely successful in injecting uh, liquidity, and so uh, there is it would be absurd to, um, not to participate to this, uh, to this party. But I have the feeling that we may be slowly but surely going into the end of these bubbles, on the end of these everything bubbles, that is right now jeopardizing the, um, the, the equilibrium uh, of uh, financial assets. Uh, and um, yes, I think we need to, uh, to, to pay attention to, to various signals of excess leverage, excess liquidity, absence of a notion of risk, uh, greed, and um, yeah, pretty much the story. And do you think, I mean, I think what the key area is here is that it feels like we deserve a pullback, but is the pullback that you expect, is it going to be a sort of a a correction, five to 10%, which takes out the exuberance. Because in many ways, this is not a euphoric top that we're seeing, if it is a top at all. It's not euphoria of mass participation by the man on the street, which is one of the reasons in some ways where you know, this valuation story, which has been there for a few years now, has been ignored because it's a liquidity story. So do you think that the next phase or the next down leg that we have is a correction or it's the beginning of a, um, a financial crisis? Or do you think that the financial crisis potential is still quite a long way down the road because the liquidity, you know, it might come out a little bit, but every time we've seen an issue return, mm. the li liquidity comes back even faster? Mm. Uh, an easy question. I mean, um, if, uh, if I'm honest, I must admit that uh, I don't really know the answer. Um, the, the party can go on uh, again and again and, and quite longer. So. There, there has been a tremendous effort done by um, the regulations and the, the, the regulators uh, around the world to avoid the same type of financial crisis. So basically, um, these acronyms like BRRD, so bank resolution, BRR, so bank resolution regime, uh, LCR ratios, these type of acronyms, they all um, provide support to the idea that the next financial crisis won't happen within the banking sector that has been extremely recapitalized these, uh, these, these last years. If we step back a little bit and we focus on the European sector, the recapitalization effort is of about 6 trillion euros in 20 years. That's huge. I mean, that's even bigger than the impact of the, um, of the balance sheets of the ECB. So the, 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 the solvency issue has been addressed within the banking sector. Uh, either in the US or in, in Europe, but is also having an amplificating effect on, on, on this euphoria that we, 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 are, we are discussing. The liquidity, the liquidity buffers, they need to be invested. As an example, within the EIB, one of, I, of, of my last uh, missions were to invest between five and 10 billion euros or dollar on sovereign bonds. Uh, careless the, the, the level of the prices, of the level of risk, of the level of, uh, of rates, because the cost of being non-compliant to regulation is even bigger than the cost of, being, of, of, of having a negative carry on your holding. So the, the, the banking sector is in a better shape, but you can still see some fragilities in, in some areas. And the so-called doom loop, which is a way uh, the banking sector is being forced to buy sovereign debt 
uh, at ridiculous levels because they are, they are AAA and because they consume very low level of risk-weighted assets is, uh, could be a factor or a trigger of a, of a, of a bigger uh, meltdown. We had the example uh, quite recently in Italy with when the, 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 the blow up of the, Italian, uh, of the Italian sovereign bonds is having effects, direct effects on the, on the sovereign spreads. To answer a little bit more specifically to your, to your question, um, I think the, the, we're, not, we're, we're living in a big bubble that is made of small bubbles. And these bubbles will deflate uh, either naturally when suddenly people uh, come back to reason or either because the regulator or the central banks will start to uh, be uh, or will start to focus on them. And uh, last week, Robert Kaplan, for instance, made a speech about the, uh, the financial instability that needs to be tackled. And I have the feeling that uh, probably if a crisis emerges, it will be imputed or it will come from the, uh, the, 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 the central bank themselves. They were the ones who inflated the, the bubbles and they could be the ones who will try to deflate it. Uh, not a very long time ago, one year, uh, one year ago, uh, Mr. Mr. Powell, uh, through the quantitative t uh, 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 tightening, was exactly trying to um, get out of this, uh, of this mess and try to exit the, the balance sheet of the, of the Fed, uh, assuming it would create some bout of volatility. He went a little bit too far, much too far. Uh, with a very clumsy uh, communication that the, uh, the financial market could not, could not really understand. Uh, but um, this is how I see the world. Either it will correct uh, because of a doom loop within the, uh, the banking sector, either it will be due, directly due to a change of focus of central bankers trying uh, to address the, the, the global imbalances that they, have, uh, that they have created for all the reasons that, that we know, inflation targeting, et cetera. Well, how do you think we move from this? Because what we currently have is almost a virtuous circle. How does the virtuous circle turn into the doom loop? Because if anything, the central bankers themselves, I think, have learned a few things. One is in the 2000s, they cut rates and the equity market fell in 2000 to 2003 and 2008. So they've now gone, it's not the price of capital, it's the availability of capital, hence QE, and hence during last, uh, last quarter's repo issues, the capital went in, it was, that was more important than the cost of capital. So these central banks, haven't they, in some ways, they're now saying, okay, we will put, rather than a, a put under the equity market or the bond market, we're gonna put a cap on volatility, so we stabilize everything. We continue to pro provide that liquidity. In some ways, it's not that we've got asset bubbles everywhere, we've got extremes, but no euphoria, but we might have a bubble in central banks. But won't they just keep on doing this? Because at the moment, there's no inflation. At the moment, there's no, you know, at the moment, as we saw with Powell's misstep with the rate hike in 2018 at the end, and that final move down, they know what will cause things to blow up. So they know what they can't do. So won't they just keep it going? Just because at, at some stage, um, the, the targeting um, financial stability and targeting price stability uh, is becoming two different goals, two orthogonal uh, goals uh, that, uh, that will uh, hurt themselves each other. The, the world of the central bankers, they have chosen to privilege the, uh, the inflation targeting despite the, uh, the bubbles that they may have crea created uh, uh, all around. They perfectly know this. Uh, they are perfectly aware of the bubble created within the fixed income market, within the corporate market, or within the equity market. But it would only require a change of focus. Uh, uh, and I, I think this is where we are, we are, we are slowly coming right now. The, the, the ongoing um, uh, valuation of the tools um, that the, the Federal Reserve is using, and also the ECB is using, is a, a, an ongoing uh, valuation that will last some months. But maybe, and I will discuss this after, uh, at the end of the interview, but 
there are probably some, um, some surprise to expect from these, uh, the, the review of the tools, the review of the CPI figures, the, the review of the methodologies, and uh, globally, the review of this inflation targeting and the level of inflation. Is the level of inflation of 2% still um, uh, relevant in uh, an environment of pressurized prices, in uh, an, an environment where the quality effort is, is, is pushing the prices to the, to the downside? Um, have a look at your iPhone, for instance. Your, your iPhone, uh, the price of your iPhone is the same than what it was five years ago basically, but there is much more technology inside it. So how is this uh, technological aspect uh, uh, being uh, taken into this inflation reflection that, uh, uh, or this inflation uh, target that the, the central bank are having? Is the CPI computed 50 years ago still relevant in this, in this new environment? Our grandmother, they were not buying phones or they, they, they could not uh, use um, uh, so many services that are free from the moment. On your telephone, you have a, a WhatsApp application that is totally free. It used to be, uh, you used to, it used to consume a lot of uh, uh, wealth before. Uh, so you used to pay for it before. So how do you account for this new environment? And this ongoing uh, debate within the central bank, I'm, I'm, I'm sure is going to, um, to lead to, to, to some surprises that we, that we will face next year. Still, the amount of risk in the, in, in the financial market is much too high. Coming back to the, 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 the 1999 years, the global level of debt was of $80 billion. Right now, it is of roughly $270 billion. So it multiplied by three. Uh, meanwhile, no need to say that the, 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 the growth of the earnings did not follow the same, uh, the same train. So we have a, a big issue of um, uh, loss of, of, of e efficiency uh, in the allocation of capital. More and more debt is explaining or is leading to less and less growth. So um, the capital efficiency is a big issue. So globally, what I'm discussing here is uh, the liquidity trap. So the Keynesian, the very basic Keynesian liquidity trap, when providing liquidity and providing debt and more and more debt, you favor uh, zombie bonds or zombie uh, corporates that are less and less efficient and that at some stage are going to, uh, to blow up. So either you, you, you let them blow up themselves, and WeWork is a perfect example, for instance, or um, uh, either you raise interest rates uh, in order to increase the debt servicing so that the, these zombie corporates uh, die themselves. What is a zombie, uh, a zombie corporate, if I may uh, uh, open a parenthesis? It's a, a company that is not able to, uh, to pay its, or its debt or more than one year of, uh, of debt servicing or more than two years of debt servicing. So its revenues are less than two years of debt servicing. If you have a look at the environment, uh, you will see, you see that in Canada, the number of uh, zombie corporates is increasing uh, to 30%. So 30% of the corporate world is made of zombie uh, corporates. In the United States, it's 20%. In China, it's 25%, and so on. And these figures have doubled in, uh, in 10 years. Uh, and I think it's not, it's not healthy. Uh, they shouldn't be uh, kept above the level of the, of the water. And uh, they are posing probably uh, crippling effects or, or or they could have cripple effects on the rest of the, of the financial uh, world, namely insurance companies, pension funds, who were made to invest in these extremely um, risky corporates to, to, to increase their revenues. But at the end, you can feel some, 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 some um, domino effects. But in many ways, isn't this just a, a kind of rinse and repeat of what we've already had? 2000 was in some ways the beginning we got a verifiable bubble, it deflated, and they used the same tools to inflate, reflate the bubble. Mm -hmm. It deflated, they used pretty much the same tools with a bit of a, a turbocharge on to reflate the bubble again. It would seem very strange that having done this for the third time, 
here we are with everything near the tops of their kind of um, the range, uh, asset prices riding high. The central banks will go, now's the time to change and bring the whole system crashing down. Aren't they just going to keep trying and trying to move this forward? And, I, and the question that really comes from this, and I know we're going to talk about the US, is that outside of the central banks may be doing something, which we'll come to at the end, what are the potential catalysts? Because we always look at the US as a potential catalyst. Is there an issue there? Or is it going to be you know, the European debt crisis? What, what is the thing which is beyond the control of central banks printing yet more money to stop this thing becoming worse than 2008? So indeed, the, uh, the, the increasing amount of debt is not a purely uh, US phenomenon. Of course, obviously, it is also a European one. Uh, it is also a Chinese issue where the, um, the money supply has increased by, I think it's 33 US trillion in, uh, in 10 years. So obviously there is a money supply bubble in China as well as a, a global debt bubble um, in the US but also in New York. The thing is, while um, the, the, the amount of debt is increasing, the sensitivity um, of stock markets and of the financial community to even a very tiny uh, uh, move of in the interest rates uh, or in the dispersion of interest rates or in the pass of interest rates, the, the, the sensitivity is also increasing. It did not require a lot of uh, misguided communication from Mr. Powell last year uh, or in, at the end of the, of the uh, 2018 uh, in, in during the Q4 quarter to uh, prop up a fantastic meltdown of, say, minus 30% in, on, the, on the U.S. equities. So yeah, the, I think it's 20%, 20, 20 from 25, 20, 20, 20 say 25% percent percent average, yeah. Yeah. 25% percent average. So here we have a, 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 big, a big issue. Uh, how, to, uh, how to address such a sensitivity to a very tiny level of, um, of a, a, tiny, a late, tiny movement in interest rates. And the key issue is how the, the central banks are going to communicate to the market when ta tackling or addressing this stability issue. There is a paradox. Right now, the, the central banks are uh, injecting liquidity, injecting uh, uh, money, uh, uh, purchasing directly assets in the primary and the secondary market in the name of the financial stability. But at the end, the paradox is also that in the name of this financial stability, they are provoking that they want to avoid. That is to say, financial instability everywhere. Um, excess of uh, capital, misallocation of capital, zombie corporates, zombie, uh, uh, zombie banks. So how do you uh, reconciliate these the same objective, and how do you reconcile this paradox? So, I think there's no there's no there's no way out apart from extremely precisely addressing some part of the uh, of the bubble. So, um, by communicating very softly, which is probably what Mr. Kaplan has started uh, last last week, um, by uh, changing the expectations into the pass of rates so that uh, many companies understand that the party is over. I can feel that the message has been pretty well received because uh, back to the first week of, the, of this year, there has been a record in issuance in uh, the European corporate market. 100 billion of issuances uh, have, uh, have been launched. By the way, they were oversubscribed three times. Uh, and this represents 20% of uh, 2019 issuance. So 20% of, the, of the, the, the 2019 issuances have been launched in one week uh, at the beginning of this year. So isn't it because um, the, the financial community is aware that the party is not going to last that long? or will not last forever, and that they should try to refinance at this very low level of debt in order to survive as long as possible. But it's also a sign that maybe, I'm not going to talk about a hike because I think it's, it's much too premature. Uh, but by changing the inflation target, for instance, 
this will send a huge message to, to, the, to the financial community. If, the, final, if the, the inflation target of the ECB is, is revised. And, and what, will they, what are they going to do there? Because at the moment it's what, 2% on HICP. So, yeah. And they can't get anywhere near it. So what are they going to kind of do? Because they can change a target, but isn't it kind of irrelevant if they could never get to whatever target they set? Well, if you admit that um, the, the new environment uh, where um, the output gap is being filled with a 1.5% uh, of inflation, then shouldn't it be logical that the target is 1.5% instead of 2? So there's a debate inside the ECB, right? Um, there are some people advocating for, OK, let's push up the target to 5% so that the people really get aware that we're going to wait a, a large amount of time before raising rates, so enjoy the party, uh, and let's reflate the whole economy. But there's also the opposite argument where um, some other people, um, in Banque de France, for instance, they advocate for a lower inflation targeting so that it would recon that the, 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 there's too, too much accommodation, that the, the right level of inflation has been achieved, paradoxically speaking, uh, and that maybe the last bout of quantitative easing is no longer warranted. But doesn't that mean that, I mean, we saw it in the US in some ways at the end of 2018 where we got I think it was 3.25% on the 10-year, which rang the bell for the equity market. And every time we get a move in yields in Europe from negative to positive, we all kind of you know, get excited because we've got growth. But then everyone scratches their beards and goes, well, hang on a minute. That whole pile of debt that every bank owns is just about to fall in value. Mm. Everyone's now bankrupt. So you have the choice. And isn't this, for the ECB in particular, you've got the, the rock and the hard place. You either have no growth, negative rates, you kill savers, you have a flat yield curve, yeah. or you try and raise rates and you kill the very banks you were trying to save by doing QE in the first place. So you either collapse the system or you have the death by a thousand cuts. How, how do you get that for Europe between what we currently have and saying well, we want growth, but then the balance sheets get destroyed? How, what's, what do you think they're going to do there? The dialing link between high rates and um, the destruction of value inside the, the banking sector is questionable. If the, um, the, the yield curve steepens, then the, the, the way the banking sector is making money through uh, the transformation, the so-called transformation uh, operations. So that's basically uh, lending at a higher rate than your funding rate. Then you're making money and then basically the banking system is, uh, remains, remains stable. Um, clearly, the, the, from one way or another, uh, the deflating the bubble will have a cost. So the question is, who is going to take this cost? Uh, indeed, there is some social cost. Probably it's not right now a big, uh, the, 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 the good moment uh, in France, for instance, to, uh, uh, to start this, uh, this process. And, and that's particularly why the, the, the last round uh, of quantitative easing was, was launched. Um, it was a social QE, right? It was particularly a QE addressed to the Italian people and to the Italian banking sector so that they could present at the end of the year um, some key ratios, uh, such as the liquidity stable rate, the, the net stable funding ratio, the liquidity coverage ratio at the end of the year. So the, the quantitative easing at the end of last year has been addressed uh, particularly for social reasons and also for geographical imbalances. So back to your question, how, how do you reasonably deflate the bubble? Uh, well, you just leave the, um, the, the bonds that you've been purchasing within the balance sheet of the uh, ECB or of the central bank. You leave them uh, slowly but surely decrease, being reimbursed and paying their coupon. And if there are some defaults, you absorb the default inside the, uh, the, the balance sheet, which will create a, a, a debasement, uh, basically, of the, of the currency, which is exactly what the, the, all these central banks are looking for. Um, QE is a, is, is, they will never say it, but is targeting explicit, implicitly uh, debasement, so lower currencies. So in case you have defaults within the balance sheets of these uh, 
um, central banks, then it will achieve exactly the same target, which is lowering the cost of capital, lowering the, uh, the, the currency's uh, gain uh, in competitivity relative to the other partners, etc. With that, because what's one of the fantastic things about um, currencies in a way, and, and also the sort of this demand for inflation is that um, Japan, Japan debases its currency, so you know, the, the, um, the yen falls. So Europe does it, so the euro falls, and then the US does a bit more QE, so the dollar falls. So if everything falls, nothing has fallen. <laughs> They're all the same level. So, and, and it kind of in some ways, let's say Europe does that. And if someone said, oh, you're going to debase the currency in Europe, I would run a mile. I would sell everything in Europe because the euro is going down. Um, so that, they get penalized for doing that. And, and there's been this bizarre world where each central bank has been trying and nobody's actually succeeded because everybody's done it together. So all that's happened is that capital's gone in with a lo lots of capital going in with a low cost and no one's currency has really moved that much. Obviously the dollar has strengthened a bit. Yes. So how do we break out of that and how does one break it without being a manipulator? Well, I mean, uh, as you said, except versus the dollar. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, I think the, uh, the value of the euro was like something like 145. We are at 1.10 or 1.11. So the euro has, uh, has, has devaluated with quite a high level of efficiency versus at least the, the US dollar. So the US dollar is the loser in this equation, in this e equation and Europe is, a, is quite a winner. So I tend to disagree with the idea that it is a, um, a zero-sum game. Uh, because from time to time, you have big devaluation effects before your other partner starts a devaluation process. And do you think that the U.S., because you talked about you know, the dollar's strong, um, but the U.S. has you know, lots of debt, lots of corporate debt, lots of buybacks. You know, if there's any equity bubble out there, you'd probably say it's the S&P and bits of the NASDAQ. So in some ways, that's the most um, exaggerated part of the market. It's also where some of the most aggressive junk and triple B volume is as well. Do you see that there's a risk that actually, or when I say a risk, it sounds like it might be a positive risk for the US. The US might be the one that comes unstuck, but which therefore may be able to rebalance first. Do you, how do you see the US versus Europe? Because it's, everyone's looking for which region's going to blow first, and how, how does that come into the framework? Well, I think right now the US are the hottest emerging market for 2020. Um, I think... Uh, and can you explain what you mean by that kind of... Because that to me yes, is like... Yes, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit controversial. Yeah, Apologize yeah. for your American audience. Um, it's, uh, I, I agree it's, it's pretty much controversial, but when you apply um, an emerging country risk uh, matrix to, to the US, well, uh, you have the feeling that uh, it ticks a lot, the, the US are ticking a lot of uh, boxes for a potential downgrade. And we, we're not discussing about something that is super or not natural. I mean, the, the, the US have been downgraded already in the past by, um, by uh, S&P, uh, I think it was in, in 2011, and uh, it could pretty much happen again, so for, for many reasons. Uh, so the way I, I, I look at the US right now is by applying exactly the same kind of metrics that I apply to uh, a country analysis in, uh, in South America, for instance. I see challenged institutions, um, and everybody would agree with, uh, with, with, with this, uh, that probably most Americans would agree with this too, that we are in a very precise moment in history where the institution, the, the various institutions of the United States are being challenged by um, the White House, typically, so the, um, the Mueller report, the, um, the Hungarian affair, uh, or the, 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 the two procedures of impeachment that have, that have been submitted to the Senate uh, uh, very recently. Uh, they all account for this fragility that I see in this uh, political landscape. So I think the, the ultimately the, 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 the institutions will remain strong and robust enough to absorb this ongoing shock uh, that, they are, that they are facing. But yes, globally, there's a feeling of um, maybe slight corruption that we, also, uh, we are also facing in Europe that is slowly uh, spreading like a disease uh, within the, um, the US institution. 
um, I, I totally trust the institutions to, uh, to resist, but still they are much more fragile uh, under this, um, this administration. Then the independence of the uh, monetary uh, institutions such as the Fed is being, uh, is being questioned. Um, so many times in, in recent, recent years, last year and the, and the year before, uh, did we hear Mr. Trump voicing against uh, Powell. He, he doesn't have a clue, they, they don't have a clue. They should lower rates. Um, I could fire him if I want. Um, uh, they, they don't understand a single thing. They don't know what they're doing. These are what we've been used to hear from, from Mr. Trump. And it, it's very, and, and even if the Fed resisted to the White House pressure, it's very possible that by resisting, it may have altered the uh, reaction function of the Fed. If Mr. Powell have delayed his reaction uh, in order to show his independence vis-a-vis -vis the White House, isn't it a loss of independence per se? Uh, um, so so I, this is a, a, a question. I think there's um, a decent loss of, of skills within the Fed, the Federal Reserves, and within the, uh, the Treasury. Um, the, the fantastic team made of uh, former MIT guys, so Bernanke, Yellen, um, um, Dudley, Fisher, they're all gone. And they, they, were, they, were, they all had an extremely high economic mindset, much more able, I mean, to tackle these, uh, these difficulties than Mr. Powell has but right now. But aren't they the architects of the doom loop? Aren't they collectively the ones who created the very framework that in some ways Powell with his pragmatic hat tried to address? The markets told him no, stop in 2018. You know, in some ways it's, it's that, um, that whole fragility that we've got was created by the, the you know, Chicago School and the MIT School and all those guys who kind of have spread their wings across the whole world. Is it that maybe we actually need a practical mind, we need a Volcker type mentality to accept the reverse, Volcker obviously in inflation. Now in this kind of, this world we need somebody who attacks the system and creates pain. But I don't think Trump will allow that. And then just finally on that, if we did have a downgrade in the US, as you said, 2000, early 2010, 11 period, it didn't have much of an impact. And in fact, as an investor, if US yields moved up 10, 15, 20 basis points relative to everybody else, I'd actually go more, get more excited about US bonds and I'd put money in. So wouldn't it be self-correcting for the US? Because Europe doesn't look great. Japan doesn't, has never looked great. China doesn't look great. So in this relative game, it will take a lot to destroy or undermine the US, won't it? Three questions in, uh, in, your, in your big questions. Um, uh, I disagree. I think, there's a, I think that you are uh, softly inverting causes and consequences. Um, uh, I don't think that the, what we are, the world in which we are living right now, which is a liquidity trap, the Canadian liquidity trap, is the product of these uh, MIT team. Uh, on the contrary, I think that Ben Bernanke, for instance, in his helicopter money, helicopter money speech in 2002, was extremely uh, accurate and was able to foresee the, uh, the, the deflation coming and was able to, to, to design exactly what should be the, the, the reaction of a central bank in case we reach the lower bound, and probably that a, 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 the Fed, that if the Fed was exposed to this situation, would have to lower, uh, even lower, so uh, um, decisively uh, uh, enter into a, a period of negative interest policies. So this has been extremely well uh, written and, 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 and foreseen by uh, Ben Bernanke uh, 20 years ago. I would, I would argue that the way Mr. Powell implemented the reverse of these policies is extremely uh, questionable. I mean, a QE is an empirical uh, experience. It's not something that is automatic. So you can't say uh, in front of the world that 
the, um, the, the balance sheet of the Fed is on automatic pilot. Uh, it's a misunderstanding of what is QE. It's typically an experience made of faces, exactly the same apply for the uh, European QE that started with lower rates, uh, then you stopped, you see what happened, negative rates, you stopped, you see what, ha you, what happened, uh, direct asset purchase, you increase uh, if it's not significant enough, uh, direct loans to the uh, private sector through TLC rewards, et cetera. You need to be pragmatic. And I think by using this very uh, unusual wording like automatic pilot, or by using a concept that uh, Mr. Powell does not uh, fully understand, such as natural rate, natural rate of, uh, of inflation, or far away from natural rate, uh, if, if I may quote him, was a, was a mistake, extremely messy, and directly accounts for the uh, equity meltdown of Q4 2018. Is a downgrade going to have an impact? Um, so first of all, I'm not saying that the, the US are going to be downgraded uh, in the coming weeks or in the coming months, uh, but it will probably, what will probably happen is first of all, a downgrade of the outlook. And you, if you have a look at what Moody's is actually um, saying and reporting, it's in his um, annual report um, published in December 2019, it's exactly this. On a long-term basis, the strengths of the US are weakening and the weaknesses are strengthening or are rising. So I fear not a, a downgrade per se, but a downgrade of the outlook that would be the start of a long series maybe of various downgrades. And so it all depends on if we have a downgrade, is it associated with still a negative outlook? So if the US were to be downgraded plus a negative outlook, it could have ripple effects in the banking system since the sovereign debt uh, is owned by the banking sector itself. And if you have the feeling that uh, in some months or some, some, some years, it, the, the US are going to, to lose their AAA or lose their, even lose their, their AA or, or could be single, then at some stage, uh, it will require for the banking sector a recapitalization and much more risk-weighted assets than uh, what is computed right now on the basis of a single AAA. So this is where the doom loop can start, a force, uh, force sellers from the US banking sector, also the European one, of bonds that you expect are going to be downgraded until it reaches a, a level of, uh, of, of return that is more compatible or more in line with uh, the risk that you take. Uh, right now, the, 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 the levels of rates, and as I'm a fixed income trader, I'm extremely cautious about valuations. You're not totally, uh, you're not rewarded for the, um, the, for the risk that is, slowly, that is slowly rising, particularly if the US are losing their status of, um, buyer of last resort, of, of funder, you cheap US funder of last resort, which is basically the contract that was uh, contracted uh, after the uh, World War II, uh, where the US agreed to found cheap dollar versus, okay, the rest of the world, of the world you agreed to fund, to use your, your, your saving glut, and you fund our deficits. But if this contract is, uh, is cheered, uh, then the, U the U.S. should lose uh, their um, very particular status within the way the agencies are, 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 are rating the U.S. And so I think the, the two could be in danger. It sounds like that's a very, very deflationary environment where basically what you're saying here is there's going to be a, an almighty rebalancing, which means that you know, any, any um, asset allocation that's done en masse is actually a, a capital destruction before you actually have an allocation. So it's never a nice, um, a, a simple um, transaction. So that sounds like the, it sounds like a sort of a, a very risky type of environment, which again, in some ways goes back to, surely that's the last thing that central banks and policymakers want who've spent the last 10 years effectively putting a cap on volatility as their means of putting a put under asset prices. Aren't they going to avoid, you know, no one wants to be the one who in history is the one that 
burst the bubble. So why don't they just keep it going and going and going? Well, the time when the Fed was trying to exit wasn't very far, isn't, isn't very far away from us. It's, it was in 2018. The time when the ECB was also thinking about exiting and was, uh, was not at all engaged into a new series of quantitative easing. This is only 12 months away from here. So have they, um, have they forgotten this, uh, this objective? Uh, have, they put it, have they put it aside? I don't think so. I think that, that it's still pretty much present in their mind uh, and they're just waiting for the occasion to uh, softly try, if they can, uh, softly try to deflate these bubbles. I agree that an excess cannot be corrected without another excess, right? This is, uh, this is how it works. This is based on, on emotions. This is based on, on, on perceptions. A misguided perception of reality uh, conducts to another misperception. And there is no, it's extremely difficult to find an, an average path between these two extremes. And this is why uh, the, 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 the central bank's community is in advance thinking about in case we are much more, much too excessive in the way we fight the, these bubbles, in case it, it leads to a new financial crisis, how can we, um, what will be the new instruments uh, that will increase the, uh, the sensitivity of markets to interest rates? Right now, as you, as you know, in this liquidity trap, the, the, the money velocity is extremely, is extremely low. So, are there new instruments um, that they will use or be able to use in 10 new times when the bubble will, uh, will have exploded? This is what they are in anticipation working on right now. So with that, we, we can sort of move from, you know, what, what we saw, I think, in, um, in the US when Powell made his misstep, the market spoke and said no, yeah, and he reversed. Exactly. And then, <laughs> and then in, Europe, yeah, in Europe, we saw you know, Bund yields back at minus 75 basis points, the yeah. market spoke. And, uh, and Draghi went, OK, we'll, we'll go back to it. So we've got Lagarde in, and everybody is saying, the last thing Draghi said was, we'll buy everything. And then people say, well, they've run out of stuff to buy. But Draghi basically said, no, spend loads of money, mm. print loads of bonds, mm. we'll buy them. Mm. What, is, what is it that you're seeing in the ECB? Yes. You just mentioned, you, you sort of touched on it, but what are the very clear signs, you know, over the next 12 months we're seeing from the ECB that will be changes, and maybe that could impact things like inflation? Yes which might ultimately be the thing that brings it all down. What, what is that, if you can sort of just give us that ECB view? Yes, um, so having worked for, um, the, for, for European investition institutions, uh, namely the AIB and quite uh, closely with the uh, ECB and also the, the, the European commissions, I try to stay quite tuned with the uh, universe, and uh, I try to, um, to maintain my, um, my network uh, within these institutions. Um, the first, first point, we need to, um, if we come back to uh, September and October 2018, the, um, the, the, the new set of QE has been uh, extremely powerful from a certain standpoint. Um, think about it. The lower rates by 10 basis points, they were, they were able to surprise the market. The lower rates by 10 basis points, they lengthen the forward guidance by saying what you just quoted. That is to say, we're not going to raise the rate until inflation definitely rise to a sustainable, um, uh, sustainable levels. They relaunched direct loans to the banking sector, namely TRTIROs, so long-term loans, at a very low uh, price at a very low level of rate. Um, they made the case for um, negative rates exemptions towards the banking sector so that excess reserves are no longer uh, being taxed, uh, so that the tiering system and they relaunched direct asset, pur direct asset purchases uh, at a rhythm of uh, 20 billion per, per month. So the package has been extremely powerful. So, since it just started, uh, even if there were so many voices inside the ECB against the package, expect the uh, end of the ongoing review to come to the end before the ECB uh, come back or comes back with a surprise. So right now, indeed, 
Mrs. Lagarde launched an assessment of the instruments that are being used. What are the main uh, uh, instruments? What are their efficiencies? Are they still relevant in the environment or not? Should we suppress some of them? Should we increase some of the others? During the next six months, and Christine Lagarde has been extremely strong recently voicing against any kind of information being displayed in newspapers. Uh, I think we will not hear many conclusions about this review, but we still have some, some flavor about it. So, as I said, the inflation targeting is obviously a, a point of, uh, of interest. Uh, they will come with something else. Uh, is it a different level? Is it uh, by stressing the fact that uh, the, the target is asymmetrical, that uh, as the Fed is doing, they will be um, uh, happy with leaving a much higher degree of inflation if ever it happens? Is it by level targeting, that is to say, suppose that you should be at, an, uh, at a, a level of 150 in terms of prices, because inflation was so low, you're only at 110. So there is a gap of, of 30 of prices that you need to, um, to bridge before being at the target. So it's not just a target. It's also about the accumulated uh, deflation that you are uh, on an historical basis wearing uh, upon yourself. Um, expect also um, the, 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 the new music that we're starting to hear uh, about digital currency to, uh, to gain traction. And digital currency is, uh, I'm just back from uh, Frankfurt, where we were discussing about that uh, in, a, in an ECB symposium. And digital currencies will probably be the way that um, helicopter money, uh, so back to the uh, uh, Ben Bernanke speech, uh, helicopter money will be implemented using the, uh, the blockchain for security reasons, um, for money velocity reasons, because it will be uh, extremely uh, efficient. Uh, and this, this, uh, this subject, I think, is, is, is clearly get, gaining traction in the US, in Europe, in Canada, etc. cetera, um, and um, deserves all our attention, attention. And so just to finish off, if you could just, because there must be, what, what is, in your portfolio, what are you? What are the, maybe the two trades that you think is the best way to kind of play this environment? Because you say that there's so much uncertainty, but it sounds like it's a, a structural change that could be coming. So, mm. how do you play? Do you have any long-term trades on? Or are you waiting? No, 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 no. I mean, being underweighted is um, is not an option because uh, your cash is being taxed. So you're losing money when you are not inv not invested. Uh, so we like selective uh, high yield names uh, within the European the European uh, uh, sector or the American one. So the idea here is um, to build a book full of carry, but a quite uh, short term carry with visibility with quite a high level of visibility. So if you have visibility of cash flows on a very specific corporate bond uh, or a specific uh, corporate, then you can uh, gain some carry. I like the idea of the reflation narrative, even if uh, I'm, I'm perfectly aware that it's still a narrative that deserves to, uh, to gain traction, but using, uh, so through some uh, hybrid currencies, such as Aussie, for instance, allows you to catch up a little bit of this narrative. Now, the risk aspect that we've been discussing is of the, the, the hedges against this uh, quite risky environment. Uh, they are quite uh, indeed uh, concentrated in my fund. So basically, I'm buying gold for debasement reasons, for low real rates reasons, for this pursuit of, uh, of debasement. I think the, the environment is extremely uh, favorable for uh, gold and for um, precious metals uh, uh, globally. Then I have edges against inflation, even if I don't really believe it, uh, believe uh, uh, about it, but who knows? Maybe it's just a, a, a genie that is going to be to get out of the bottle, even if it's for a very uh, low period of time. So steep news on the, on the yield curve, US yield curve, uh, the European yield curve too, uh, 5.30. Uh, for instance, and that's pretty much my, my book right now. Volatility, long or short? Um, volatility, um, hmm, the, well, it's, it has a negative carry impact, right? So um, I prefer 
you need to be extremely good in timing when it comes to, uh, to, to vol options. So uh, um, as a hedge, I'm trying to, to build up some, it's counter, counterintuitive, but I do believe that in case, and we've been discussing about that, in case a, a proper equity meltdown happens, then the Fed will have no choice than uh, lowering the, um, the Fed rates. So um, I'm, I'm wearing um, or holding euro dollar options, so euro dollar call options. What strike? Hundreds? Ninety nine seventy five. What sort of level are you? Yeah, um, ninety eight fifty. Right. So uh, ninety eight fifty calls, and uh, I'm selling it uh, out of the money calls. So seventy five and, and ninety nine all. So basically uh, eighty seven. Uh, no, basically eighty five, eighty seven, ninety call fly. Brilliant. In December. Excellent. Good. Well, thanks for those trades. Thanks very much for, for the views in, on, on the market and the world and, and the inside ideas on, on the ECB. It's, uh, it sounds like it's going to be second half of the year could be very interesting. Yes, exactly. Um, thank, thank you very you much so for your time. Good to see you, Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.